So in these first few videos, we're going to start with some introductory information. First, thinking about what learning is and what we mean by behavior analysis. Then a preview of the way we'll be framing our talk about conditioning in this course. Then we'll touch on just the tiniest bit of history before finally getting into a little of the unique methodology of behavior analysis. So together, this first set of videos is going to set the stage for all the future topics that we'll dive deeper into. So first off, why is a course on learning useful? For one, we're going to see that common sense about why a behavior happens or how to change a behavior is often dead wrong. People do things that are counterproductive all the time and then wonder why their dog or their child or their spouse behaves in a way that they don't want or find themselves doing behaviors they don't consciously desire to be doing. In this course, we're gonna learn about behavior in a nuanced way that is, that is informed by the scientific literature, generally based on basic experimental research. Uh, with a course like this, we're also gonna learn how different behaviors are motivated and what factors, both internal and external factors, can affect behavior. And finally, throughout the course, uh, and especially heavier towards the end of the course, We'll see how we can apply what we learn to improve our lives or the lives of other people or other animals. So when we say learning, what are we actually talking about? As usual, it's hard to capture such a foundational concept in a simple definition, but you'll find something along the lines of this in most textbooks. So something like learning is the acquisition, maintenance and change of behavior as a result of life events or Another textbook might say something like, learning is a relatively permanent change in behavior that results from some type of experience. I've like, to, regardless of the fact that the specific wording might be a little different across all the different learning textbooks, I've highlighted what, what is basically the common elements in, in both of these and that show up in most definitions to really emphasize the framework that's used in this field of psychology. We will always have a sort of laser focus on behavior broadly defined, and we're going to be interested in what makes behavior change, like how we pick up new behaviors or leave behind old behaviors. Uh, what we won't sp spend a lot of time on is direct genetic influences on behavior. Like, yes, some animals have an instinctual reaction, and that may be interesting to biologists, but a learning psychologist will be more interested in the ways our experience, our development shapes our behavior. A couple points of clarification are important here. First, learning is different from what we might just call maturation or physical growth. Like our behavior might change simply due to growing older, but that's not really what we're talking about here. We're talking about things that change based on your experience. For that matter, uh, there are things we experience that can technically change our behavior without them being learning. So for example, learning differs from general fatigue, general like tiredness, since that is a temporary change and it affects all of our responses, all of our behaviors. Getting fatigued is more of a generic biological response, not really something we classify as learning. So that's not what we're going to study. Finally, we're going to see that learning tends to be inferred based on performance. In other words, based on what we actually observe a creature doing. But it's possible in some circumstances for learning to take place without us yet seeing the change in behavior. In other words, we might really think of learning as a change in the probability of certain behaviors or the propensity to perform, perform certain behaviors. And maybe we don't see that immediately, but you know that, that is eventually how we will um, detect learning. Now, I've been using this term behavior, but let's be a little more explicit about what we're, we're talking about here. Uh, we'll start this course with a simple, broad definition of behavior as anything an organism does, basically. So sitting, crying, farting, making a disgust face at the smell of a fart, bringing a spoonful of soup to your mouth, chewing and swallowing, uh, buying a candy bar, pulling a slot machine lever, pulling out your phone, uh, turning on a light, all of these would count as behaviors. But we're gonna go even further and say that behavior can include private or covert acts like thinking and feeling. So yelling at someone is a behavior, yes, but so is silently raging to yourself and planning how to get revenge. Uh, the key here, really the, the, the fundamental key concept here 
is that we are not going to treat those inner thoughts and inner feelings as causes of behavior the way someone might in other fields of psychology. Instead, we're going to investigate these phenomena as just more behaviors that themselves need to be explained. If someone yells and we explain it by saying they were angry, we haven't actually explained that much at all. We still need to understand why they had that emotional reaction. We need to explain the anger, and that will require looking at that person's history of experience throughout their life, history of learning and reinforcement and things like that, what they've gone through in similar circumstances in their past, which is to say we need to investigate the learning that led to that inner anger behavior. So we'll take a, a broad view of behavior. now. As I said, this is kind of a different way of approaching things than what we see in many other areas of psychology. So the field of learning takes a, a pretty distinct approach to understanding humans and animals. We call it a, a natural science approach. Basically, it's kind of an extension of biology, but focused on explaining a creature's behavior. That means we won't spend a lot of time talking about mental constructs. And in fact, we're going to shy away from most cognitive explanations of behavior, and we'll focus as much as possible on what is directly observable. We'll seek to understand what processes and, and factors control or affect behavior. And the primary way of doing that is using experiments, manipulating variables in an environment we control in order to observe how the behavior is affected. Thus, you will see the field referred to a lot as the experimental analysis of behavior or EAB. This, this differs from the actual subfield of biology that looks at like wild animal behavior. That's called ethology. But ethologists, that, that subtype of biologists, they mostly observe a creature's behavior out in its natural habitat. But that has a downside. That means they often can't get strong evidence for causation to test their explanations and the mechanisms of why a behavior occurs. For that, we need experimental control. We often need to bring creatures, whether it's animals or humans, into a laboratory to test these things experimentally. That's the experimental analysis of behavior. Now, this, this different framework, this natural science approach, it's going to differ a lot in emphasis and in terminology and in methods from other fields of psychology and how they discuss behavior. This course is not going to sound anything like a cognitive psychology course, for example. I don't think that the two fields are fundamentally opposed, per se, but they investigate questions through a very different lens, using a, a different framework. Now, when I say the approach we're studying is the experimental analysis of behavior, you can think of that as a form of basic science. It's scientists studying behavior for its own sake, to, to better understand how the world works and why things happen. But of course, there are a lot of people whose focus is more centrally on application of that knowledge. So there is a related area of work we'll talk about called applied behavior analysis. This is the field of study focusing on, on application of principles and methods and procedures of behavior analysis, but to solve practical problems. For example, using this stuff that we learned in the lab uh, to figure out how to treat OCD or eating disorders or autism or addiction or other conditions to uh, improve parenting or schooling, uh, maybe to train animals better, to improve industrial safety or conserve natural resources, to encourage healthy behaviors, to improve sports performance, all sorts of stuff like that. Uh, but the field of applied behavior analysis, so ABA, can't really exist without the found foundational understanding of behavioral principles that comes from EAB. The experimental knowledge is really what drives ABA applied practice. The two fields definitely overlap. They inform each other for sure. We are going to focus most heavily on the experimental analysis of behavior, at least in the early parts of the course. We'll spend a little more time on applied behavior analysis towards the end of the course. Uh, and of course, that topic is often a, a whole course of its own. Indeed, uh, it's an entire career path. And as we'll discuss later, uh, we'll get into the details of that. But you can get a master's or even a doctorate in ABA, for example. And we will sprinkle some ABA uh, principles and examples and things all throughout the course. Now, to get you thinking like a behavior analyst, we might start by asking a couple of simple questions for some very straightforward behaviors. 
So, for example, let's say you have a roommate who leaves their dishes in the sink constantly, or maybe a partner who leaves the toilet seat up all the freaking time, and it's starting to drive you a little mad. So, you could pick one of these two behaviors here, leaving dishes in the sink or leaving the toilet seat up, and ask yourself, how might we change one of those behaviors? What are some strategies we could try out? I actually suggest you pause the video in a moment here and think of at least three ways you might try to change the behavior. You can be creative. Hell, you can be unethical for this thought experiment if you want. So for example, you might secretly watch the person and jump out and zap them with an electrical cattle prod every time they do the unwanted behavior. Or you might chop off their arms so they're physically not able to do that behavior anymore. Uh, perhaps those strategies would change how often they did this unwanted behavior. Yeah, there might be side effects or it might even backfire and lead to more of the unwanted behavior. But take a moment, pause the video and try and make a little list of different ways you might change one of these behaviors. Okay, so if you make a big list of ideas for changing one of these behaviors, you, you might even take a moment and try categorizing down those different ideas into categories of, of ideas or proposals that are similar in nature. What, what patterns would you notice? As students of behavior analysis, we'll basically be asking this kind of question for all sorts of behaviors. What things would make that behavior more or less likely? And how do we find out that's the case? But also, we're going to be interested in what other factors, what other variables might be at play that might make behaviors like this maybe harder to change or, or easier to change in certain circumstances. For example, what qualities in a person might make them more likely or less likely to change what they do after you try one of your behavior intervention ideas? Or what elements of, of your past experience with that person socially might be relevant to your attempts to change their behavior? What parts of that person's history or life experience might influence those behaviors and might influence you know, how easily they can be changed? Um, what time of day or time of year is your intervention most likely to work? What kinds of behaviors are going to be easier or harder to change? Like, is the behavior of leaving the toilet seat up, is that harder to change than the behavior of drinking coffee every morning? Is it easier or harder to change than the behavior of smoking a cigarette or of putting your pants on before you put your shirt on in the morning? Again, as behavior analysts, we want to look at all sorts of factors like this, uh, including things like motivational factors and personal life history factors and a lot of other elements to best understand and predict behavior and the ways it can be changed. Now, before I end this first little video, I want to give a heads up of what to expect in a course like this. A lot of the research literature we're going to discuss in this course is based on research with animals. Primarily, animals are used as a model for humans, or, or even a model for all creatures to the extent that principles of learning may be universal. But also, behavior analysts sometimes study animals in order just to better understand that particular species or even that individual animal. For example, to better understand how to train horses or how to help treat aggressive cats that people have as pets. Or maybe uh, to understand the behavior of wild wolves better in order to help conservation efforts and so on. Primarily, though, I, I think the tendency to use animal models is because Animal research just allows us a level of experimental control that's not always possible with human research participants. Like it or not, federal laws and institutional ethics boards, they allow researchers to, say, raise rats in a laboratory, but certainly not baby humans in a laboratory. With an individual human, we have no way to know about their particular life history and their past experiences that might have influenced their prior learning, prior to our experiment. But with a rat raised in a laboratory of a known genetic strain, we can rule out a lot of those confounds. We can know for sure whether the rat has ever seen a snake before in its entire life, or whether it's ever seen the color purple, or whatever variable we want to test, we can control its past exposure to things, we can control its learning that may have happened up until our experiment, and thus we can test some of those learning variables more directly. Now. We will come back to this stuff later in the course, as I do think it's valuable to discuss and, and maybe even debate the ethics of animal research. But for now, I just want to give a heads up. 
that a lot of the course, a lot of the basic experimental work that we will talk about, it comes from work on non-human animals, at least initially. And then often it gets, you know, um, confirmed in humans or, or you know, um, then we test, uh, you know, additional variables with humans as well. So on that note about animal models, I'll actually end this video with a kind of extended example here of how animal research might offer some unique input to help us answer psychological questions that are harder to answer with just humans. So for example, I might ask a crowd of 200 people, which, which sex prefers pink over blue? I've actually done this in some of my large classes before and overwhelmingly people will say females, pink, males, blue. Assuming that's true, I'm not saying that is true, but assuming that's true, I might then ask if that preference is genetic or is it more learned? Is it something based on past experience, socialization, culture, right? Basically, this is a nature nurture kind of question. Where does such a preference come from? Is it innate or is it something more social and cultural? I'll usually get a mix of answers here, of course, right? We, but, but we want to answer that scientifically. All right. Now, similarly, I might ask a bunch of people, which sex prefers cars over dolls? And whatever you think, do you think the preference is genetic or is it learned? Like if you think there is a preference, do you think it's genetic or learned? And here I usually get more students thinking that males prefer cars over dolls. Uh, you know, more than females. And, and some people think it's more genetic, whereas other people think it's more learned. So it's a sort of open debate, something we need evidence to address these kinds of questions. Now, the question I want to ask then is, what sort of evidence would help us answer the questions? What sort of evidence would help us distinguish behaviors that are genetically determined from behaviors that are learned? What kind of studies could we run to answer questions like this empirically? Now, I want to be really clear for, for the purposes of this class, I don't care about the actual answer to this specific question. Okay. Leave the stuff about kids and their preferences for red and cars and whatever, leave that to the developmental psychologist or the social psychologist. I'm bringing this up because I want to show how animal research can be one method that helps us answer questions like this. Basically animal research can be an additional prong to our, our methodology to answer hard psychological questions. Okay, so that's why I'm bringing this up. So here's one example um, where we might want to try to answer those earlier questions about sex differences. For example, studies have actually looked at, at human children at one to two year olds. So little kids, babies to, to early toddlers using a preferential looking paradigm. And what we find consistently is boys do prefer cars over dolls, regardless of the color. They don't, they don't care as much about the color, but boys at that young, young age do prefer cars over dolls and girls prefer dolls over cars. Again, regardless of the color they are. When it comes to color, both sexes actually liked red the most at this early, early age. So at this age, we don't even find a color preference. None of that pink or red is for girls nonsense, which may not surprise those of you who know a little history and know that the typical association of blue with boys and pink with girls used to actually be reversed in the Western world historically. Um, in fact, when we test boys and girls at an older age, they do show the stereotypical modern preference of blue for boys and red or pink for girls. Uh, that does seem to at least suggest some learning influences, right? something we weren't born with, but likely learned through socialization and culture. So far, so good. But what about the fact that even at a very young age, we do find boys preferring cars and girls preferring dolls. We still don't know if that's something inherent to their biology or something they learn really early in life in that first year or two, just by being exposed to those toys or those colors based on their parents' gendered choices of clothing and decorations, basically how the kids are treated or what they experience. In other words, they're early learning. So we don't know yet, right? We haven't been able to answer that gen genetic versus learning for, you know, toys like that. And here's where animal research might provide a new angle of, of sort of scientific attack at answering these questions. Just as studies have measured the toy preference of very young humans, other researchers have done studies measuring the toy preference of very young animals, including male and female monkeys, a close primate cousin of ours. And the key here is that since these animals 
were were raised in captivity researchers could actually guarantee they had never played with toy cars nor with dolls prior to the measurement so we know that they haven't had a past experience of being you know given more toy cars because they're a male monkey or something like that so they could rule out past experience they they never saw other male monkeys playing with cars and other female monkeys playing with dolls or anything like that that might be a social factor the researchers can rule out that past experience with these items in a way that we could never do with human participants so they could ensure that past experience and, and learning is a factor that's controlled for that's that's kind of ruled out in the study Okay, so what did this? What did the the data show in in a study like this? In the top right here, the the graph that we can see, this is for humans. So you see the toy preference of very young humans, and we do see males strongly prefer toy cars when they're just choosing between a toy car, what we might call sort of stereotypically masculine toys, so a, a toy you know wagon, truck, car, construction vehicle, that kind of thing, uh, compared to the more stereotypically feminine toys of dolls or stuffed animals. I'm not saying these things are actually feminine or should be. I'm just saying that's the stereotype that's being tested here. Now, female babies or toddlers, female humans, you can see they don't have as strong of a preference. They're a little more open-minded. They'll play with both types of toys, but they do play with dolls a little more than cars. That that kind of fits with the evidence we heard about before, right? I mentioned before, a lot of studies have looked at this and, and found that same pattern. So this is just replicating the same pattern we've seen in lots of studies. But what about those young monkeys? So here, the, here are, uh, I think it was rhesus macaques that they used. I'm not, I'm not positive, but um, here's the data I'll show you in the lower right from the monkeys that they tested. Despite no socialization, no cultural pressure, no experience watching other males or females play with particular toys, indeed, despite zero experience with either type of toy, zero exposure to such objects at all, we find that males prefer cars, car type toys, and females are more open to either type of toy. And thus, compared to males, right, they're, they're a lot more likely to, to pick up dolls or stuffed animal types. So this suggests that among primates at least, and humans are a type of primate, there may be a biological predisposition for males or females towards certain types of toys, or we could say certain types of play behavior, or certain types of physical interactions. That means we can sort of use this as one way of ruling out social factors, ruling out learning by using animal models. Again, I'm not really interested in this topic. I mean, there's there's a lot more detail and debate here, but we're not we're not looking at this because we care about this specific topic, but just seeing an example of how using animals might give us new types of evidence to answer questions we're interested in in psychology. All right, we are going to end this video here, and in the next little video, I'll introduce the basic ideas of conditioning, the basic mechanisms by which learning tends to occur.